We're really excited about the conversation that we are going to have over the next one hour with a group of subject matter experts. Um, my name is Wendy Chamberlain, and I, along with my colleague Katie Hyatt, have been working with BFA, our Bankable Frontier Associates, and the CIFAR Alliance to pull together what we hope is a preliminary conversation on what should be in a very important and complex topic that talks about the role of putting gender at the center of the conversation of climate change. Um, we're glad each of you is here. We appreciate the time you are taking. Uh, during this conversation, we hope to capture a lot of your questions, but it's likely you may leave this conversation with a slight feeling of dissatisfaction because you hopefully you may wish that we have given more time to talk about different things. So we hope there's follow-ups to this. Um, let me turn it over to like Katie, and she's then going to introduce our colleague, Nellie. Katie, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, we are, we've got a really fantastic lineup. Um, we have first, we're going to be, we're going to have uh, Amolo introduce, uh, introduce this, this panel discussion um, first up, and then we're going to have a a panel discussion with three fantastic speakers. So we have Anrita Njeru, who is the um, a program manager at the Rallying Cry. Uh, we have, and she's going to be speaking about gender and climate finance briefly. Uh, we then have Sandra Guzman Luna, who's the founder at GFLAC, uh, which is the Grupo de Financiamiento Climático para América Latina y el Caribe. And she is going to be speaking about uh, gender and climate smart in innovation. And then finally, our third, spe our third speaker or panelist is Rohini Kamal. And Rohini is an assist assist assistant professor and research fellow at the BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, um, BIGD, uh, at BRAC University. And she's going to be discussing uh, her work in Bangladesh and what gender uh, and a climate uh, gender and a global loss and damage fund looks like. Um, so what we have planned for you today is, is after sort of introductions by Amolo and Nelly, um, who you will see here on the chat also. Nelly is from CIFA. Um, and we're going to have a panel discussion where each of our speakers will introduce each other and introduce themselves and the uh, the topics that they the subtopics around gender and climate that they are focused on. Within Wendy's going to ask facilitate a brief panel discussion uh, before we really open it up to questions from you all. Um, I know there's a lot of interest from the chat. Um, we have a really fantastic lineup uh, today, and so I'd ask you to please put your questions in the chat um, if as as they come to you, you know put them in the chat and we'll collate them and hopefully that we'll have a good amount of time towards the end. Um, as Wendy as Wendy mentioned, please introduce yourself. Feel free to share your LinkedIn if you want to connect with people. Um, let us know where you're you're calling uh, you're calling in from and what your um, what your initial uh, what your focus around gender and climate is or your interest is. Um, and we'll be sharing some resources at the end of this. Uh, so please look out for them. Um, there'll be some follow-up from this. And um, yeah, let's get started. Thank you, Katie and, and, and Wendy. So I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Amolo, which I'm, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to uh, introduce her and thank everyone for joining us. Today, uh, I'm Nelly Ramirez. Right now, I'm calling from, from Panama in Latin America Climate Week. And I co-lead with my colleague, Jesse, who's also here today, the Secretariat of the CIFRA Alliance, and also serve uh, as a Senior Climate Innovation and Ecosystem Architect in BFA Global. So I'm very grateful to finally be here. It's been uh, a long journey, along with Katie and Wendy, putting this together and also introducing Amolo Noeno, my CEO at BFA Global, who will provide opening remarks and set the stage for today's discussion. Amolo is the CEO of BFA Global, an impact innovation firm that combines research, advisory, venture building, and investment expertise to build a more equitable and resilient future for underserved people on the planet. 
She also serves on the board of Catalyst Fund, which is BFA Global's impact fund and accelerator, banking climate tech ventures, building a resilient future for in Africa. Uh, BFA also holds the Secretariat of the CIFAR Alliance, uh, our host today, which is a global network of organizations and advancing innovation in the climate adaptation space for underserved communities. Uh, Amolo, she was formerly the Managing Director of Digital Divide Data Kenya and the Deputy Director of Financial Services at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She's a graduate from Harvard and Princeton University, and she's also the co-founder of Africa Online, which was East Africa's first internet provider, which operated in eight countries before it was sold to Telcom South Africa. Amolo, David El Ser, our Chief Innovation Officer, who is also with us today, Maelis Carrero, the Managing Director of the Catalyst Fund, have been an inspiring managing team leading BFA into the climate world with really impactful and ambitious initiatives in, in this space. So thankful uh, to have you, Amolo, here to lead the way for our discussion. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Nelly, and um, thank you everyone who's on this uh, webinar. It's going to be a fantastic session, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to all parts of it, and I want to give you um, a brief introduction, probably preaching, I mean, essentially preaching to the choir, but just saying um, at BFA Global, as Nelly was describing, we focus on innovation for inclusive economies. And we've really been seeing and learning the thing we all know, but it's more tangible as the climate crisis uh, evolves, which is that women are really the unsung heroes of managing resources like water, food, and energy. Um, and that women do not have the same access or say in how these resources are used. And therefore the impact of the climate crisis is falling harder on them. So I think, both for uh, BFA Global as a company, for the CIFAR Alliance as, a, as an alliance, and for this session. I'm sure that what we're aiming at is giving women the power to make decisions, to be part of the discourse, um, to be part of, uh, to participate in what is um, an unfolding global, global emergency. Um, and we realized that um, women contribute in, in a variety of different ways um, and that jointly as a, as a group, we hope that we're starting to build strategies that will stand up to the, the climate uh, uh, challenge. Um, of course, we're aware that many countries do already start to have policies in place for gender inclusive, inclusivity. Um, and I'm sure many of you are actively working on the ground to make sure that these policies lead to actual change at the local level. Um, and many others of you are working to increase the um, and improve policies so that they recognize not just gender in inclusive uh, solutions, but broadly um, include bringing bringing together a range of different um, Inclu inclusion issues into the climate discourse. Um, with COP28 coming up, it's more important to, than ever that our discussions are shaped by a diverse perspective, including a focus on gender. And for this reason, um, CIFAR Alliance and BFA Global are putting together a, a session, a set of sessions, this is one, that leading up to COP that will be crucial in setting the stage for these conversations. This event will show that when we bring together gender insights and inventive climate solutions, we're not just tackling climate challenge. We're also building a more inclusive and sustainable world for all of us. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today and hearing from the, the different experts on the panels, but also from all of you in the audience. I hope you'll be active uh, participants, both in the chat and in the, the end of the session. Um, and I very much look forward to the discussion and um, hand back uh, to Kate. Thank you so much, Amolo. Um, fantastic. Well, we've got 62 people on this call, which is excellent. Um, and without further ado, I would love to move over to our panel discussion. As I mentioned, we have three fantastic speakers today. We're going to kick off with uh, Rohini Kamal, who's the as an assistant, assistant professor at BIGD, and she is going to be discussing uh, what a gender loss and damage fund 
uh, means and, and the importance of it. Um, and this is going to be really grounded in her own work in Bangladesh. Um, Rohini. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, as you mentioned, I work at a, at a university. I teach and I do research. Uh, mainly on energy and environmental economics, which includes climate change. Uh, so our work really focuses on livelihood impacts from climate change, but also impacts from the responses, people's responses to climate change. So this includes impacts from uh, the changes, the physical changes themselves, heat stress, uh, rising sea level, et cetera, but also livelihood impacts from the adaptation, uh, from green transition. So we place climate change within underlying socioeconomic and environmental processes, including pre-existing vulnerabilities. And this, I think, uh, for gender particularly, really highlights why placing climate change within pre-existing processes and vulnerabilities, uh, why we find that the impacts themselves are different on different groups of people. So loss and damage is essentially uh, dealing with the negative impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities, uh, particularly in uh, historically low emitting countries. So these impacts are already salient. We are already seeing them in places like Bangladesh. Uh, from cyclones, we've seen uh, more frequent heat waves, damage crops, uh, reduce people's ability to work outside. Uh, we've seen health impacts from increased salinity and so on. Uh, so, we see that some of these impacts, as I mentioned, impact different groups in different ways because there are underlying differences between groups of people. So uh, when we're talking about loss and damage and how funds and solutions reach the most impacted, unless we figure out how these impacts are different on different groups of people, who the most vulnerable are, and how solutions work out and how the responses are actually different for different groups of people, uh, it, it, the, the fund will not be as impactful. So at, at the university, some of my work uh, includes, um, that's relevant to loss and damage, would include disaster response uh, and household welfare, spe especially around anticipatory action around flooding. We see if post-disaster relief can be more effective if done preemptively and what kind of impact it might have on gender or women and female-headed households, households with disabilities and so on. We look at impacts of climate change on agriculture, aquaculture, on daily wage earners, ultra poor households and women. So uh, with that, I'll just stop. And uh, just this is a brief overview of why I care about uh, loss and damage, why having a gender perspective is important, and also why maybe an, an intersectional gender perspective is important too, you know, which uh, we'll hear more from, uh, I'm sure, later. Thank you so much, Rohini. That's a really great introduction and brief oversight um, into loss and damage funds um, for women. Now, I'd like to now move over to Sandra Guzman Luna, um, who, can we, have, can we see you, Sandra? Yes. Sandra is going to be talking about uh, a gender and, climate, uh, gender and climate smart innovation and her own experience with GFLAC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thanks a lot for the invitation to be here. Hey, I'm Sandra Guzman. I'm from Mexico. I'm in Chile at the moment, but normally I'm based in, in the UK. So a, a little bit of um, a, every everywhere. Um, I'm very happy to be here because uh, I would like to share a bit of, of what we do in GFLAC, the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a women's led organization. Uh, and our aim is precisely transform the financial sector to mainstream climate change in their operations. But we cannot tackle climate change if we don't mainstream also gender perspective and, and of course, all the sustainable principles. Um, in our experience, uh, the functionality or the way that the financial system has been working, particularly related to climate change, has been focusing in, okay, how, how much we are going to reduce in terms of emissions. And let's, let's check um, if we are reducing emissions, then we are doing great. But we are missing the, the actual point of increasing well-being. Uh, climate change is not only a battle uh, in terms of uh, environmental problem, it's an it's a inequality problem. It's, it's, it's showing us that not all of us are suffering the same and therefore we have to plan differently. And, the, and, and in, that, in this sense, what we are really trying to, to do is analyze how the financial sector is operating, what type of principles they have to include to really transform and not only about reforms of the World Bank, 
and reform so the IMF but really how we are going to transform the world but we really want to be transformative we need to include gender perspective better data you no know? how 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 is the impact uh, differently from women and, and men but also we need more uh, and better access to finance uh, and this is particularly related to the fact that not many women have the access to finance and if we really want encouraging um innovating ways ways to face climate change it is important to open open, better, direct access and mechanisms uh, to, to women that are in many, many, many cases, the ones that are in front line dealing with the, the problems. And, and I would say that the big important element that we have to focus in the next uh, years, if we really want to uh, tackle climate change, is to innovate in the way that the financial system and the financial mechanisms work. Uh, we have to think out of outside of the of the box and really start thinking how to create new uh, industries, for instance, around the protection of nature, where women play a major role. The uh, uh, communities, indigenous communities, women at the local level, and if we really, really want to deal with the problem uh, from the bottom, we need to create better ways to, to, to invest in them, in their vision, in their conception of, of what life really is and, and how we value life in a, meta, in a better way in the financial sector. So uh, this is just to, to, to give you a little bit of what we do and what we want to achieve and very, very happy to have this conversation to, to further uh, share some of the, the things that we are doing. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Sandra. And you'll see in the in the chat, I've linked uh, both Sandra and Rohini's uh, LinkedIn profiles. So if you want to connect with them, please do so there. Um, I would also say if you have any questions that you want to ask the speakers, please put them in the chat. We'll certainly have space for that uh, in the second half of the panel discussion. Um, finally, we have Anrita Njeru, who is the program manager at the Rallying Cry. Um, now, Anrisha is going to be discussing gender and climate finance, and you'll also will also be sharing some of the Rallying Cry's resources uh, in the resource list that we'll share at the end of this session. So they've they've done a lot of fantastic work uh, around the nexus of gender and climate uh, across Africa. Um, but I won't spoil Anrisha's story. Uh, let me pass over to her. Um, thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today to contribute to this very important uh, conversation. Um, as you've heard, my name is Anrita Njiru. I am a business consultant and growth strategist, and I've spent the last 14 years working with um, high potential SMEs in both East and South Africa. My current focus of work is at the nexus of gender, um, climate, and ag. And as Katie mentioned today, I will be contributing to the conversation by speaking uh, more to our experience with uh, gender and climate finance and what we've been able to see and implement on the ground so far. I work with an organization called the Rallying Cry, which is an early stage initiative designed to um, drive private sector capital into the hands of women entrepreneurs on the front lines of climate and uh, in ag. We are starting with a focus on Africa and specifically in Kenya and Zambia, because from our research, we felt that that's where we could have um, the greatest impact and pilot before we move to other geographies and regions. I'm sure many of you are wondering why our focus on African women, and it's mainly because we believe they are solutionaries and not the victims or uh, beneficiaries they are a lot of times uh, portrayed to be. And because they have been exposed uh, to climate change effects and obviously are disproportionately affected, and because they have to um, feed their families and lead their communities um, on the front lines of climate change, we have seen that they have um, developed very innovative solutions and have become early adapters. Um, but unfortunately, there is still a gap, a financing gap um, they can't access in terms of credit to uh, or capital to uh, grow their businesses and scale the climate and gender impact they're already having. And that's why we are very passionate uh, about working with African women. We are doing this uh, mainly in two ways. Uh, we are building a pipeline of African uh, women businesses starting in ag, like I mentioned earlier. 
and we are building their capacity uh, for them to be able to uh, become investor ready and engage with investors so that they can attract the capital they need to scale their businesses um, and amplify their climate impact. At the same time, we're very keen on shifting narratives about these women so that uh, all the ecosystem players um, can rightfully view them as the solutionaries they are. And like I mentioned earlier, not as victims. Uh, we mainly do this mainly by research. Uh, it was mentioned that a few of our publications will be shared. So I hope a lot of you will get to engage with that um, and see what we've been able to capture in those uh, reports. And then um, we also partner with capital providers who are keen on investing in women and have uh, a gender lens, just to also support them um, and build their capacity in terms of building uh, climate forward products and inclusive products and solutions. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, like I mentioned earlier, and uh, looking or excited to engage with all of you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for those introductions. And hopefully for people who are joining this conversation, you're hearing about new organizations, but it won't be now the first time you interact with them. And I'm already seeing connections being made in the chat. Um, I wanna walk back a little bit about the impetus for this conversation. It's likely that most of us who are on this call have had conversations about the intersection of gender and financial inclusion and even gender and climate. Um, but this conversation in particular came out of several conversations that Katie and Nellie and I have had with others that as we move forward in the financial inclusion sector and talking about um, the climate crisis we are in, we run the risk of being gender blind. And I want to turn towards our, our panelists here and, and to talk about this um, perhaps in a more grounded fashion. Um, and so I'm going to go into a series of sort of scripted questions, and then we're going to open it up to this group to ask questions as well. But we'd love to hear from each of you, and maybe I will go in reverse order. Um, first, give us a real life example of uh, why does it matter to, to have this topic centered on women from the work that you are doing? And maybe you can, because climate change can be rather an existential topic for many, um, tell us why it matters practically for her and, and it shed some light on this from where and how you do your work. Um, so Anne Rita, I'll turn it over to you for starters. Thanks. Um, thank you, Wendy. So like I mentioned earlier, um, the these African women entrepreneurs are really the center and focus of our work. And I mentioned this because we believe that they can actually offer a global pathway um, into dealing with the climate change crisis by sharing their stories and their innovations and business solutions with uh, the larger ecosystem. Uh, my mind goes to one particular uh, entrepreneur, one of our network and uh, agribusinesses that we are supporting in Zambia. And she's an organic uh, strawberry farmer who um, is also currently um, refining her business model to also move into biogas and has already secured a partner for that. Now, um, highlighting the story of Bupe, which is her name, I think will really shed light on why women are important and our experience with our work. And what we've also seen is they really play a key leadership role and they tend to bring a lot of the community with them and impart these climate um, innovations and knowledge around these innovations to the larger community. So if we do support these women and make sure they access the resources they need, including capital, that means there'll be a ripple effect in terms of how uh, climate change is addressed and we'll be able to uh, manage it with the urgency it requires, not only in Africa, but on a global scale as well. So what we did with Bupe, we were actually able to um, connect her with um, an African fund managed by a woman as well, that was willing to be flexible enough to um, create a financial instrument that worked for her. And what did this look like? Uh, first of all, unlike traditional uh, financial instruments, uh, there was no requirement for security in terms of land, which a lot of African women don't have, but rather the investor was able to look at the growth of her business and her current revenues, uh, and this provided um, security enough for her to be able to be fronted um, the capital, which 
is uh, was a catalytic um, debt instrument. And since we have seen um, her business really grow prior to this uh, receiving this capital, she had 100, uh, 1,100 outgrowers who she supported and who she had uh, trained on her innovative method of regenerating soil without using chemical fertilizers. But since uh, getting this capital, it has um, helped her to acquire new machinery, which will help her access a new market. And what this means is that now she's actually in the process of onboarding an additional 1,000 farmers over the next year, or small um, uh, holder farmers that she works with. So just from this example, it's clear that, um, and I think it's important that I mentioned that she's actually uh, consistently repaid uh, on this capital that was provided without any uh, defaults and has, has been able to communicate and engage with the um, investor very um, consistently and will probably attract more capital. So what we see from this example is, uh, first of all, these African women on the front line of the climate change crisis are actually uh, business opportunities that investors need to look at as such and engage with strategically because by not doing so, they're leaving money on the table um, and yet they could lend to these women um, and grow their portfolios in that sense. But that's just one example that could give us to how we've uh, supported some of these women and just the skill uh, we see and the amplification of impact in terms of sm smallholder farmers engaged and climate um, crisis management or adaptation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Sandra, how about within your work? Can you think of any examples that you could share with us on why this centering on women really matters for the solutions that we're trying to pursue? Thank you so much, Wendy. Yes, of course. Um, well, as you feel like, we have been working a lot in the context of associations as well at the regional level and at the national level. But I would like to highlight one example that for me was very transformative and, and it's giving me a lot of like, the, the elements to, to keep pushing this agenda. Um, and I, I would like to emphasize, first of all, that when we talk about gender perspective, it's, it's not only about uh, yeah, bringing more uh, voices from women, but it's, it's fundamentally recognizing that we have different perspectives about things. And, and if you develop a project, if you develop a policy with both perspectives, like it's going to be more, uh, more let's say, effective. Like if you just have one, one side a perspective, like we are 50% of the, of the population in the world. So we, our perspective matters. Um, and women in that sense have different perspectives in terms of the development of renewable energy, the protection of water, the protection of forests, how to manage uh, transport, uh, because we see different needs. So I, I would like to share, like, for instance, I had the opportunity to be in the Amazon with a community, with different communities, but one particular community that um, that has a lot of power for, from from women. women projects to, to really not only bring resources to to share with the population, with the community, to develop, for instance, an ecotourism um, place where they can bring people from outside to to know more about the the, the forest and the jungle and, and really share not only as, a, as an ecotourism experience, but also as, as embracing the culture, like really sharing the values and the spiritual beliefs uh, to really bring people to the ground. No? Because as I was saying, normally when we think about climate change, we just think about emissions, but we forgot about the human relationship with nature. And what this group of women are really trying to bring people to, to show how important it is to keep connecting from nature, from, from Mother Earth, and really try to, to transform the perspectives of, about what, what we want to see uh, in the planet. However, we already identify a number of challenges that these women are facing uh, to really develop projects. For instance, the very first problem is the ownership of land. You know? uh, women are normally not the ones that own the land. And if you want to access to certain funds to implement projects, they will ask you, okay, show me your papers. No? And indigenous communities don't have these papers and they have been there forever and no, no one gave them those papers. So this is a massive problem that we have, we have to recognize because we have a lot of indigenous communities around the world. A lot of them are led by women and these women don't have those papers to, to, to show no, the ownership. So this is this is a problem. The second element is precisely about access. And, and I would like to emphasize access in, 
thousand times because we hear, for, for instance, from the World Bank, from the IDB, from the different financial institutions saying, no, 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 we have a lot of money. We have trillions of, of, of flows going around the world. And it's like, well, who is accessing to those funds? Certainly indigenous community, certainly not a local actor. So I think it's not only about uh, the quantity of money, but it's also the quality and how that money is arriving to the, to the ground is a massive issue that these communities are facing, particularly these women. The, the third element is about the procedure. Uh, I think for, for, for many local communities, we have to think not only about the mitigation side, but also adap adaptation. And as we know, adaptation is not only a change in technology. Adaptation is process. And in these local communities, process matters because they, they follow their below, their beliefs, their, their, their processes at the, at the local level. And normally, the financial institutions don't care about those processes. They want to see results in one year. I want you to show me that in one year you are making such a transformational changes. And it's like, that doesn't happen in one year. No, this is a process. And, and this is a big, a big challenge that a lot of local entities women are facing to demonstrate the bankability of the projects. And this word, what I don't like very much, is it's there. It, and it's in the, in the, in the ecosystem because a, Every time that a woman wants to develop a project, it, it, they they have to demonstrate that their projects are bankable, are scalable, are like transformative enough, and sometimes um, demonstrating this at the at the at the at the small scale is very challenging and it's very difficult. So that's why I do believe that it's a moment to innovate, to think differently about the support, and not only believe that this massive quantities of money are the ones that are will will transform because sometimes it's not only it, it's not about the trillions it's about those thousands that well invested in the local uh, people with a uh, women leading processes uh, without so much bureaucratic processes will be more effective than trillions and trillions in projects that will have even other externalities and we are observing this in of these uh, mechanisms to take into account the needs, the needs of local actors, the needs of, of, of people, and particularly the needs of women. And this is a huge opportunity to, to rethink you know, how, how we want to see the impacts at the, at the local level. And, and this is a, a very good example that has been helping me to show all what is missing, you know, the massive gaps, but at the same time, the opportunities that we have to rethink uh, 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 if we really want to be transformative. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think you have also just hit more nail on the head in terms of you know, face in a work that a lot of us do around scale is always impactful. And yet what we see, especially with the effect of climate change, the effects are very real and they are very local. And the importance of focusing on local, while the numbers won't, we can't compete on numbers, we can compete, what you're saying is on impact over time. And yet that presents challenges too. Rohini, over to you. What are, what are, what's an example that is coming to mind for you as we talk about uh, the realities of this? Thanks. So I think one, when we talk about experts, uh, so uh, when we usually mean people who are doing the, uh, uh, really being able to identify and quantify the projections of the temperature rises or other impacts, but how those impacts actually play out and uh, those changes play out and impact people's lives. The experts of that are the people who are impacted themselves. So so the, the expert on how, say, a woman in Bangladesh, how increased salinity or rising temperature impacts her would be women who are especially working in agriculture or dependent on natural resources, women who are working outside and therefore more susceptible to increase heat or cooking uh, on a stove. So exactly how the impacts play out, the expert has to be the people impacted. So the solutions, therefore, the best solutions that will work on ground are also the ones that um, can be can be identified by the experts with the lived experience. So for us, I think it's very important to be first 
understand that, that we have to learn from people who are actually on ground getting impacted and the solutions also uh, are identified by them. Uh, I mean, it's a lot of my work has taken me to different parts of Bangladesh and it's really been an eye opener. Um, it, it, I, you know, sea level rise, increased salinity are things that we hear about, but I think in the most um, impacted regions of Kolna Shatkira, what that increased salinity means for the day-to-day -day lives of women, uh, the issue, because women are the ones not only getting water, but also responsible for making sure everyone's eating. So the most basic human need is uh, tend to be that, that solution. So uh, that problem solving comes from women, so especially post-disaster, uh, when channels of maybe getting to work or uh, even aid that, that falls through, exactly how to get water, how to get food, all that is usually prob uh, trouble. This troubleshooting is done by women. So uh, the the solutions and the innovative ways, the social uh, networks that they rely on, the uh, the solutions that come from the women would have to be enhanced. I think, especially in uh, agrarian, lower income uh, communities. So uh, I think one of the most uh, extreme examples I've seen in impacts that you know was very difficult for me to. Uh, understand from sitting in the capital city, Dhaka, was that increased salinity has meant that there is very few water resources. So there is maybe one little pond in a huge village, which is uh, being safeguarded with rainwater for use for everyone. So when women have, um, uh, when, when, when women are menstruating and they're using rags for washing, they cannot go to that pond because that pond is being oversaturated by users anyway. So there's, there's uh, you don't have that sort of privacy and also there's a lot of stigma attached to it. So women, there are women doctors in the area who have said that young girls are going to them and saying that, can we get pills to stop our bleeding? Because we don't have, we just have this one source of water and we cannot go there to wash our uh, rags that we use for menstruation. So that is something I had no idea till I actually went and So what exactly what the problems are, um, unless the people who are impacted are being able to get their voices and problems across, it's actually impossible to know, even if you know the quantity of the increased salinity of exactly how the impacts happen. Uh, similarly with solutions, uh, we work with um, uh, disasters and post-flood. Sometimes at the shelter shelters, there are ex, uh, safety issues for women, also for female-headed households or women in general who are looking after their children, who are looking after elder family members who have mobility issues. It's very difficult to just uh, move when you, have, when you hear a warning. Sometimes a warning also doesn't reach um, some of the uh, uh, women from ultra poor households because uh, uh, there is still um, they don't have access to cell phones. There is still one cell phone in the whole house, which is usually used by the person working outside. So we're women sometimes are missing out warnings. Um, and also, if, even if they get warning to be able to move to shelter homes, there is some impediment. So working in solutions of exactly how to get the warning across, uh, what kind of uh, relief, what, uh, when and how to actually get the relief uh, to the most impacted uh, people, to women, uh, women, female-headed households, house with, households with disability. So th that sort of uh, solution and problem solving, uh, wh wh when it's coming from women, I think is sometimes is different. And also, uh, as people mentioned, women are 50, most people are women. So it's also different women have different uh, realities and uh, experiences. So when I'm talking about a household in a very rural remote area, uh, some of our solution was, okay, maybe relief, it might be more efficient to use a mobile phone or uh, having a, a digital transfer. Um, uh, but then, um, you know, talking to people like in some households, women still don't have access to uh, the phone or uh, ability to be uh, ability or com uh, they're not comfortable with digital finance. So then figuring out how to then reach those women uh, that, so yeah, the solutions also have to be uh, considered. The one thing I would say is that, that there are a lot of non-formal, non-market contributions of women uh, to the household in terms of food, in terms of how, how looking after people who are impacted elderly or their children, quantifying and recognizing that uh, is very important for loss and damage to so understand how time is impacted, how the losses and damages actually play through in non-market, non-quantified ways. Uh, understanding informal mechanisms is important because especially in resource constrained governments like in Bangladesh, you know, a lot of uh, the social safety nets uh, that are there in extreme cases 
are not as much there for in poorer countries. So, un, so people rely on very much on the in, informal mechanisms to be able to problem solve. So understanding those are important. So I think the first thing is ident identifying the channels through which women get impacted more. Second is identifying or uh, enhancing the, the channels through which women are actually contributing and uh, problem solving. So I think this would be the two ways, uh, the two things that I would like to highlight. I mean, honestly, I'm still agog at the example you gave about women and the access to water for their menstrual cycle. And I'm wrapping my mind around that. Um, here's the thing. The examples that you are giving the challenge about them is they really don't fit into sectoral silos. And this challenge is how we do development. We like our lanes and we like to approach these challenges within our lanes. And yet, where to begin? Um, if I have a strategy that is specific to a sector, where do I begin on this? And uh, we hear this question from others. What cha the challenges you are describing, in many cases, it would be easy for us to say, um, okay, somebody rallying cry has got this, we are all good. Um, and we will go on and just stay in our lane and, 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 and bounce our balls in our court. Where do organizations begin on this? To, to begin to confront the complexity on the issues you are talking about. What would be that first step you would recommend? Because I can see how this is very daunting for organizations to consider and to hope that others might really take the, the lead on running forward with this. But I think we have collective responsibility to respond to this. The question of how is super relevant open to anyone on the panel to, to respond and then we'll open it up for questions. We've had one really good question so far. We want some more in the chat, so please, Adam. But over to the panel, how, first piece of advice, where to begin as for organizations, thanks. Just go ahead and go for it. Sandra. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, yeah, I think I think all what we have been saying are challenges that I would say are historical challenges. No, are, are not only related to climate change, but generally speaking, as women, we have been suffering from many different discrimination types, and 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 climate change is just increasing and intensifying those uh, situations of, of of vulnerability. But at the same time. It's as the ones that have a lot of ideas to 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 rethink and to recreate uh, what has been failing um so in response to that i would like to share that for instance in gflag uh, we realized that one of the critical gaps is knowledge uh, and knowledge matters because if you have that knowledge then you can do stuff and you can propose and you can create and you can actually discuss if that knowledge is is actually good or bad no but if you don't know it's very difficult so we launched um uh, well, first of all, we started with a youth program on sustainable finance. It, it, it was dedicated to to start building capacities uh, on on youth or younger generations in Latin America from from different countries. Um, so we we train around 500 uh, youth representatives every year for the for the last four years now. And this year we decided to launch a, a program dedicated to women because we realized that the needs were very different and, and at different stages. So we launched this program on sustainable finance for women uh, where we are working with women from different, um, let's say, it, are women that are related to the to the financial sector, but also others that are not necessarily in the financial sector, but want to know more about climate finance, including some uh, local uh, communities and, and more like local representatives. Um, and it has been actually fascinating, first of all, to understand the challenges that they are, they are facing at the institutional level, because what we have been discussing is a lot of the, the problems that women are suffering in the ground, but also women are very uh, are facing these challenges at the institutional level. For instance, the lack of uh, of decision making uh, um, positions, no, because we have a lot of technical uh, women in the back. But when it comes to decision making, the ones that are taking decisions are men, and and they don't necessarily take into consideration some of. Well, it's how to 
ourselves in, in certain circumstances. Um, and also the, the second level is more about the solutions, no? From our perspective, what can we change? How can we how can we be uh, agents, uh, change uh, change makers in the context that that we have? And obviously, the circumstances are very different. And and I have to say here that, for instance, um, as you may know, uh, in Latin America, we have also a problem in terms of security, no? Like when you are, uh, we are facing security for uh, environmental defenders and, and, and so um, women or men uh, that are very outspoken about a uh, climate reality or climate issues. Uh, Mexico, for instance, where I'm from, is the most dangerous country to be a climate or an environmental defender or human rights defender. And this is also playing a role, you know, and to, to what extent we want to push women to be stronger and, and more empowered and go out and talk and speak loud. But all of a sudden, we are also scared about being too loud because the, the insecurities are becoming a big, big issue for us, like a, it's threatening us as well. So it's not only about the, the problem of climate change, but it's the system itself. So, however, we would like to continue with this uh, capacity building process with women. Actually, we are going to have one uh, for local community. More uh, people at the local ground uh, to, to really think what are the options to, to mobilize more financial support at the in the ground. Uh, and we think that uh, even if we cannot mobilize thousands of trillions, at least if, if these people know more about what are the options, then at least we open a, a whole new possibility of thinking. No, it, it's like, okay, I, I might not have uh, access to the, uh, the, the Green Climate Fund because it's extremely bureaucratic and difficult, but at least I will know what other philanthropy uh, foundations are there, know what potential areas of innovating mechanisms can exist. And at least we can discuss those and, and open the, the window for, for new possibilities to, to all these women as well as youth. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandra. Katie, I'm gonna turn it over to you for any remaining questions we have in the last nine minutes. Um, and like I said to at the beginning of this conversation, there's many of you who may leave this conversation wishing uh, you could ask more or hear more on it. And we hope to provide more time and space for that in the future, but do stick with us to the end of the call because we wanna capture the rest of the, the questions that come up. Thanks, Katie, over to you. Yeah, and I, we've got a great question in the chat, but just before I ask that, I wanted to, to say to everyone in the group, if you have resources that you think are particularly useful around gender and climate, please share them with us in the chat. We are collating them. Um, we have a, a doc, which I'm going to share with you all after this. But if there are particular resources that you have authored, come across, research, um, please share them with us. If you don't want to share them in the chat, just email us. I think um, you have our email addresses. Um, yeah, so um, please don't keep that information to yourself. Uh, finally, we have a question from Anna Duran in the chat which is about the research gap um, in, in gender and climate. Um, so we, we see a far more male or men researchers that, than women. And this question really talks about, for Anna's question asks about, you know, how that hinders research and the chances of gender indicators to study climate change. Uh, and the and the the impact on women um, and inclusion of their perspectives. Now, I think that probably the best person to answer this is Rohini. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit from your experience um, and what you're seeing in terms of uh, woman-led research into this area, and I guess the the reception of that research as well. Um, I think this year's Nobel Prize in Economics kind of highlights that when a woman is researching, what they research is sometimes different. So looking at time spent uh, in care in non-paid work and how that contributes to the economy and that's how that's linked to the formal and market economy itself, those, uh, those are really important. So I think when women are researching uh, questions like that, uh, you know, might have a better way of being identified. And as I said, especially in looking at climate impacts, that is severely under-researched, that how actually the time spent looking after people who uh, who are vulnerable, looking after, uh, making sure the food is there, making sure the water is there, 
all of that work is a huge part of the impacts and therefore has to be a huge part of the solution. So um, so I think the underrepresent, so my, I'm, I'm an economist, so the underrepresentation of women in econ economics and other, I think in all uh, sectors really, uh, really, you know, uh, really stops us from getting where we need to go. Uh, and then there are some topics, of course, the one I mentioned, it's something that women might not feel comfortable even to talking to uh, men about. So unless you have women who are going there talking to people, some of these issues might not even come out. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I think I'll stop there in terms of uh, issues and challenges. I think it's very common across all sec sectors, women, whether it's uh, women in, in uh, agriculture or women in the care industry, women who are in working in hotels, women who are going to work, taking public transportation, the kind of, there are, there are real physical barriers to getting, uh, going and accessing resources around decision-making. And that actually also uh, sort of permeates through into research in that area as well, especially as you uh, go up the ladder into more um, in positions where you have to make more decisions. So in general, I think I would say uh, sort of related to the last question is anything that enhances access to resources, decision making, being able to research what uh, you want to research, having uh, having control over that, but also understanding access to innovations. So it's not just innovative solutions and new technological solutions, but who has access? How can people have more access looking at the uh, the mechanisms of access and the channels of access, uh, I think those would be really important um, also to getting to solutions. Thanks so much. And and just to hand it over for sort of any final thoughts, Anrita, I know that the rally, rallying cry is really focused on feminist research and, and the, the gender and climate nexus. Do you have any sort of thoughts as to how you see the the inclusion or exclusion of of, of indicators and and uh, participants in this work. Um, yes, um, thank you for that. But um, I also just wanted to take one minute to speak to um, a question that was in the chat about uh, capital trickling down to these women, and I think what is key is commitment from leadership. Um, and this means that gender should not be a nice to have, but might be part of the core strategy. So I think uh, gender audits to identify inclusion gaps and biases are important, as well as uh, gender budgeting to actually allocate capital to go in uh, into the hands of women who are actually developing innovative solutions. And just to speak to that, as I give my final remark, I think uh, applying an ecosystem approach is very critical. Um, there's in our work, we've seen a general willingness and commitment to being more gender inclusive, but a lot of the ecosystem players lack a clear pathway on how to do that, and many of them are working in silos. So through our work, we're also trying to um, convene these ecosystem players to uh, make sure that not only the women entrepreneurs, but also the capital providers, the development finance um, community, as well as researchers, like you mentioned, um, and academics, contribute their part because none can be able to solve this um, um, challenge or problem that we're facing of inclusivity on their own. But I think applying an ecosystem approach is really critical for um, climate action in that sense. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anrita. Um, we have lots of questions remaining in the chat. We will be capturing all of this information. Um, and we will ask some of our speakers to respond to any questions that we don't we don't no longer have time to get to. Um, let me pass it over to Nali Ramirez Monchara, um, who is going to make the closing marks. Um, Nali, we got you there. Yes, thank you, Katie. And uh, I have the uh, the great work of acknowledging and, and giving, uh, expressing our gratitude uh, and providing closing remarks for, for the session today that has been so, so uh, interesting. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging some very special individuals whose contributions have been key. Uh, first, my gratitude to Amolo, the CEO of BFA Global for setting the stage for today's discussion. Special mention to David Del Cer and Jackson Love, co-chairs of the CIFAR Alliance, whose vision laid the foundation for today's important conversation. And I also want to recognize uh, my partner, Jesse Fripp, 
co-lead of the Secretariat, whose commitment and time and efforts have been instrumental also uh, driving the C4 Alliance mission forward. Thankful with Wendy and Katie for their contributions uh, uh, to, to have this event come to life. To our steam speakers, uh, so inspired by you, Anne, Rita, Rohini, and Sandra, for so generously sharing their experience and perspective with all of us today. I think your insights have really enriched our understanding and hopefully empowered us to take uh, further action, uh, most importantly, together. As, clo as closing remarks, I would like to highlight some of the key topics, uh, the key role of innovation and considering how the financial system operates to be more inclusive for women, uh, which was underscored by Sandra. And Rita's perspective on shifting the narrative, women and developing countries being at the forefront of the solutions, the innovations, and the changes we need and not as victims. Uh, Rohini's impressive on the ground perspective, underscoring the importance of women leading the way of all we need to adapt because of the key role that we all know and understand that women play within families and communities as primary primary caregivers. Uh, and also the importance of enabling their voice to come out, as she said, and to talk about the challenges and barriers that they're facing accessing resources. Rohini also underscored how gender sensitive loss and damage fund can address disparities exacerbated by gender norms and cultural practices. Uh, David El Ser shared in the chat, uh, the universal climate uh, resilience initiatives that we are launching as the C4 Alliance. And we are, uh, we're gladly going to share more about that, uh, which is also very much in line with what Rohini so enlightenedly shared with us today. About key success stories and learnings, Andrita, shared this inspiring innovation with Farm 23 Strawberry in Zambia, and all the way to the Amazons with Sandra, who highlighted the great challenges women face in accessing capital for green entrepreneurship and, and, and in general, and the local challenges and contributions of women in Bangladesh, as Rohini also stated. As we move forward, it is essential that we encourage organizations and founders to embrace this intersectionality uh, approach uh, when talking about gender and to break free from singularity. Much of the conversation, as Sandra says, are uh, of, in the space, in the climate space, are centered on net zero emissions and carbon markets. And it is also important that we pause to underscore the significance of integrating gender into the climate dialogue. Because as Sandra said, the human relationship with nature uh, needs to be forefront and center. And as, as we, as half of the population worldwide, our relationship with nature is pivotal in, in that discourse. Uh, I think everything that we've underscored and learned and heard from today has illuminated the vital role of gender in the climate agenda. And we feel as the CIFAR Alliance and BFA Global, it's our collective responsibility to ensure that a gender lens remains central to climate finance, innovation, adaptation, and all aspects of our climate action efforts. Uh, of course, we will be uh, we will be following up with this event uh, with a blog with the key insights, uh, sharing the recording, and hopefully staying in touch with all of you through LinkedIn and our direct contacts. We've shared a lot of resources in the chat, but we will try, as Katie was mentioning, to put that all together for you uh, in a follow up email and and with a blog that we will be uh, publishing shortly. Thank you to our esteemed speakers, panelists, and participants. Uh, to all of you for your time which is the most precious resource we owned. You really inspired us all and um, have a great rest of your day.